Dari is back. Within months, he's had a fantastic response to Prison Predator Hunter. And this is part two. Huge thank you to the 500 people who got his book. Huge thank you to all of the people who reached out and have given him your support and love and respect, which he fully deserves, because that was one of the most gripping podcasts and interviews I've ever done. And I just love how Gary just speaks so matter-of-factly, and he's a very calm person, yet you could see this inner strength from everything he's been through and the positive crusade that he's on. And we're going to be getting to more of that here soon. So, and all of the links for Gary's stuff are in the description box below this video. If you've not seen part one, part one will be at the top of the description box as well. So please check that out. Huge thank you for coming back, no, Gary. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. No, it's it's it was great, and then and the the positivity was brilliant. But we speak about that. Yeah. About, you know, I'd come here twenty four hours a day if you wanted me to. <laughs> <laughs> you said um, earlier. There was a crazy story about an attempt on your life. Yeah. So uh, it was a few years back now, but I already changed my life. So, you know, I wasn't taking part in violence and being violent and anything like that. And a situation occurred where two uh, people fell out and they fell out. This is crazy. They fell out of a, a statement, face, a Facebook statement. <sighs> and it was as simple as that. But what transpired from it was just lunacy. So. Someone's wrote a statement about someone's wife and this person has took it that, you know, he's not having it. So he wants to beat the person up. So I say to him, look, there's other ways you can do it. Just, you know, come and talk to me. We'll have a chat, blah, blah, blah. But don't go and do anything. This person, I calm them down. They come to me. So they said, no, I'm not having it. They can't talk about my wife. Like I said, I get that. I said, but you're going to go there and, and create mayhem and do too much violence. So I said, what about if I tell you where this person is now, right, you go and speak to him, but you don't beat him up. You don't beat him up badly. You've got to promise me you won't beat him up badly. So he said, okay, then I promise you. So he went to the person. I told him where he was. He went to the person. He grabbed him, slapped him, said, don't ever say that about my wife. That should have been it, finished. But the person who it was had a father-in-law that now is taking offense to it. And he wants to meet this person that's beat the person up and so it comes to a head that the, the he's taking his kid to, he's picking his kid up from school is his father-in-law connected to anybody yes but i won't say who it is right and so he he followed he followed the person home they was bringing their kid home from school and I see what he was doing. So I went up to him. I said to him, look, you're not doing this. I said, he's bringing his kid home from school. I said, arrange to meet him and sort it out another time. But you're not doing it in front of his kid. The kid was five years away. He said, it ain't happening. So he said to me, what the fuck's it got to do with you? And he threw three punches at me. And I went like this. And I missed every punch. And I went to him, crack. And he flew, hit the wall, went down. So now I've picked him up and he's like a drunk man. And I've pulled him to his car, trying to put him in his car. Lo and behold... The other person comes up with his kid and he says, he shouts out, keep that now. He's f***ing taking the liberty because I've brought my f***ing kid here. Let me take my kid in my house and I'm coming back down. And I'm like, oh, for f***'s sake. So I'm trying to put this bloke in his car and he comes too. And so he's put his kid in the house. And now he comes running towards me. I've got this bloke here. And then this bloke, I'm grabbing them both like that. And I'm saying, look, you're not going to fight. You're not going to fight. I'm getting hit. <laughs> and I said, listen. Do what the f*** you want. And I, I, I let them fight. They fought. They was killing each other. Like One of them was getting his head hit off a, a, a post on the street. And I just jumped in my car and I drove off. Right, And, I, and that was it. That was as far as me. It's nothing to do with me. Do you know what I mean? And But photos was taken of the person badly beaten up. And the police was told it was me that done it. Right? It was nothing to do with me. It was nothing to do with me whatsoever. And so I think nothing of it, you know, the police don't come and ask me questions, but I'll find out afterwards what I've been accused of. And uh, so it was nothing to do with me. And so I went about my life and then uh, I see the bloke and I said to him, look, 
It was nothing to do with me. You're saying it's me. It was nothing to do with me. I tried to stop it. You threw punches at me. It was nothing to do with me. And I said, look, just leave it at that. I said, you can't actually fight anyway. I said, oh, I'm not saying I'm a fighter, but you can't actually fight. I watched you. You can't fight. And uh, I turned my back to walk away from him. And he had something behind his door. And all I felt was bang. Hit me around the head, around the baseball bat. And I turned around. When I've been hit like that, I turned man and he caught me on the eye. You can see as my eye sags. And then he hit me across here. I got 25 stitches here. I got cuts in here and everything. I'm in a mess. But this is in the street. And I say to him, look, please stop. I don't want you to get nicked. And I take him back to his house. I said, you know what's going to happen. Do you know what I mean? And uh, he it calmed down. He disappeared. He went away. And uh, the next thing I know, the police are raiding houses looking for me. He's told the police what he's done to me. And he's told, you know, I don't know what he's told them, his life's in danger or what, but they come looking for me. And uh, so I find out they're looking for me. But honestly, I've changed my life. There's, I'm not doing anything, no crime, nothing. But uh, mobile phones, the worst things in the world. So I know people that's involved in crime. I'm not going to walk into a police station with a mobile phone. So I smashed the mobile phone up, right, and I chucked it, right, because I'm only talking to people, hello, girl, how are you? But they're into crime. I don't, I don't want it to be brought on me. No one's going to look through my phone. And so I smash it up, and I've got bandages on my head. I've been to the hospital, you know, and I've been all stitched up, and I, I'm suffering with serious, serious concussion. And so I walked into the police station. Because they're raiding houses looking for me. So I walks in there and the policeman at the desk, I said, uh, I've come to report a crime. Because I'm playing, you know, I'm not going to, you know, tell them what, what needs to be told. I said, I've come to report a crime. And they said, I said, somehow I've been beaten around the head. I don't get it. I said, I don't understand. They said, what's your name? So I said, I think it's Gary Hutton. And she went, okay, got up, run out the back. <laughs> and the whole police station come out into the foyer and all standing around me. I was like, okay. He said, come with us, you're under arrest, blah, blah, blah. I said, like, what's going on? <laughs> like, what's going on? And so they took me into the police station and uh, they want to interview me. But I'm telling them, I've lost my memory. I don't know what's going on. I haven't got a clue what's happened. I don't understand anything. I'm confused. And all I'm doing is sleeping in there. So they get a nurse to come in. The nurse talks to me. She gives me some aspirin or whatever. And she, she goes back to them. She says, yeah, he's, he's fine to be interviewed. So they come back to me and they say to me, uh, you're fine to be interviewed. I said, no, I'm not. I said, you know, I've lost my memory. I ain't got a clue what you're talking about. I don't even, you know, I'm not sure if, it, you know, I don't know anything. And uh, they said, uh, I said, I want a second opinion. They said, what are you talking about? I said, well, really, I want a first opinion because that was a nurse. What does she know? <laughs> and so... They said to me, okay, then we'll get you to a doctor. So because on my record it says he's an escapee, they have to take things seriously, right? And apparently I'm going to be doing some terrible things to this bloke. He's going to get murdered and all sorts, well, whatever, whatever the story is, right? So they asked the sergeant, can they take me to the London Hospital Whitechapel? And so he goes, does a procedure. Oh, no, this is going to be difficult because of A, B, and C. So. They take me out of the cell. They've decided to take me out of the cell. When I get out of the cell, there's a convoy of, of cars in the yard. And there's all policemen. They handcuff me to two policemen. They take me out to the yard, put me in the car. There's one in front, one behind. And we go on a convoy to the hospital. They're telling me they're going to arrest me and charge me for smashing a window. This gets crazy, right? <laughs> So when, it's already crazy. It's yeah, gonna get crazy. Yeah. So when we turn up to the London Hospital Whitechapel, there's armed guards standing there, right? And I'm like, the fuck is going on here? What have I done? Because <laughs> at the minute, I don't know they're going to charge me for smashing a window, right? So I get it goes into us. So I walk past these men. They put me in a cubicle, right? And I'm still handcuffed. And this doctor comes in, a young bloke, and he looks at me. He sees all the palaver that's going on. He must think I'm a mass murderer, right? So he he grabs my wrist and he touches my wrist and he goes, yeah, he's all right. Yeah, he's all right. Take him out. All right. They take me out, put me back in the cell. We go there. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, my head's really messed up. Do you know what I mean? And I'm laying there and just laying there, 
sleeping. And they kept waking me up. And they wake me up. He said, you're, you're okay to, for, uh, to be interviewed. The doctor said, he's past your fit. I said, no, nah, I want a second opinion. I went, are you joking? I said, no. <laughs> I said, we can't do all that again. So I said, well, someone's got to sort something out because I'm entitled to a second opinion. So there goes our, the, the sergeant, right? The sergeant says, yeah, take him, but come on, let's calm it down a bit, right? So there goes to me, I get to take me to the desk. I said, look, we're going to take you to your hospital. You're not going to do nothing. I said, I ain't going to do nothing. I said, look at the state of me. So they say, I say, I'll, I'll do this, right, on, on the condition that when I get into the hospital, you can handcuff me, you can do whatever you want, but when I get into the cubicle, just give me my human rights to take the handcuffs off and let a doctor examine me. So they go, all right then, that's fair. I said, is everyone agreeing to it? And all the police said, yeah, we agree to that, we agree to that, if you behave yourself. So we goes, uh, we goes out, the sergeant said, I don't have to go in handcuffs, right? He, he agrees then, I don't have to go in handcuffs, leave me, he's all right, he ain't going to do nothing. So as we go out into the yard, this young copper turns around, he goes, I ain't going nowhere with you with, with, without handcuffs, put these on. I said, no, bollocks. I said, he said, I can have no handcuffs, right? <laughs> he goes, he said, no, I'm not going anywhere with you. I said, come on, let's go back in. He said, no, 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 no. Oh. All right, then. He said, I'll agree that when we get in the cubicle to take them off, as we agreed. But please wear them while we're going there. I said, I'll quite come on, then. So I put the handcuffs on. So I'm sitting in the car like this. They take me there. When I get to the hospital, there's no armed guards. There's nothing. I goes in there. He, to his word, two of them stand outside. They let me sit in there. The doctor comes in, gives me an examination, starts asking me questions. He says to me, he said, I'm surprised you can remember your name. He said, being hit man seven, seven times with, with a baseball bat, I'm surprised you can remember your own name. I'm surprised you're even standing up. All right? So I said, okay. He, he gives me an examination, gives me some medication. I've got to go back. He's made an appointment for me to come back. They take me back to the police station. I go to sleep. Thinking, you know, I'm going to be let go soon. Four days pass. I'm still there. Four days. And they want to charge me with smashing a window. And they said to me, look, we're going to oppose bail for smashing a window because we don't want you on the streets. I said, don't be stupid. I'm not going to do nothing. What's going on? No, this is what we're going to do. This is it. Takes me to court. Go to court in a sweat box. Gets into the court. I don't know that there's two other people in the police station connected to this, this crime. Two people that had a fight. They're on their statements, blah, 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 whatever, right? And so we go to court, and I said to, when we get to the court, I said, can I have the, the person that I know, right, can I have him in my cell, right? I said, so I just want to have a chat with him before we go upstairs. So he says, all right. Then. So this person, I'm having a chat with him. I said, look, they're going to keep us, they've told me they're going to keep us off the street. They want, want us off the street. They're not going to give us bail, right? And he went, what for? I said, but well, this is it. I said, when it involves me with the police, it's different. I said, so when we go to prison, when we go into the court, try and keep us away from me. You ain't coming anywhere near me. Don't come where they're going to take me. Because I know when I get to prison, I'm going to be taken somewhere really dark and lonely. All right? I said, you just go and do what you've got to do. Right? And he's like, nah, you're exaggerating. I said, I'm telling you, just behave. I said, I'm not a bad person, but they just treat me differently. All right? He said, all right then. So he's sitting there, he's sitting in his cell. Door swings open. Right, and we're sitting there, and you couldn't see no one, but the door swung open. Hutton, come out the cell. And I went, and he looked at me, he went, the kids next to me went, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I've never seen any business before. I said, look, just stay there, don't do nothing. Right, so I walks out, Hutton, get on the floor, get on your knees, get on my knees. Uh, they come and handcuff me, right, and they say, the judge wants you handcuffed in the dock to prison officers. I said, okay. So I one on this arm, one on this arm. and But it was a big, there was loads of them, right? So they take me upstairs into this dock. It, this other geezer has got to fit in the dock with me. And so I've got two prison officers and they make an arc around me, right? And I'm, I've am got a bandage on, on my <laughs> head, right? I'm sitting there with a bandage on and I'm trying to see this judge and I can't really hear what he's saying. So he said to me, uh, uh, how do you how do you plead, Miss? I said, Well, I'm I'm going not guilty because I, I don't know what's going on. He said, well, I'm going to put you on my mind for three months. I said, Well, what? He said, For smashing the window. I said, It's not a prisonable offence. So he said, No, you're right. I said, Well, I plead guilty to it then. Right. <laughs> so he said to me, He goes, uh, Okay then, hundred hours community service, and you have to pay five hundred pound compensation. I said, Who am I paying five hundred pound compensation to? He said, uh, he said the name of the person. I said, he's in the cells now telling him he's hit me around the head seven times with a baseball bat. Don't be stupid. I said, I ain't giving him no money. <laughs> right? So the judge said, okay, we'll squash the fine. 
right? They squashed the fine, but I had to do the community service. But I couldn't do the community service because every time they told me to turn up somewhere, I couldn't remember where to go. <laughs> right? So I couldn't remember where to go. So I didn't have to do the community service. Now, this bloke, he's on demand. He's in there for three months. And I'm like, okay, he's had enough now. So, but the police are getting me, come, come to the police station, will you make a statement? Because we, you know, this is attempted murder. He gets 10 years in prison. So I'm like, I don't remember it. I keep telling you, I've lost my memory. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You know, they ended up, they chucked me out of the police station, called me all the cunts, go and get the fuck out, go and fuck up. I said, look, this person done, apparently done this in the street. He told you what he done. That's good enough. Go and do what you got to do. What do you need me for? I can't remember it. So then what I done was I got in touch with the bloke's family and I said to him, look, he spent three months in there. All he has to do is withdraw his statement because I don't remember nothing. And I I can't tell no one nothing because I don't remember nothing. And so he withdrew the statement and got out. But what he was telling people that I put him in prison. Fucking arsehole. It's the deaf bastard. Yeah. Confessed yeah. to the police what he'd done in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Withdraws his statement. And then he's telling people, you put him in there. Yeah. yeah How I'll does put, that work? Yeah, I know. But now, when he sees me, he swerves me. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? He swerves me. Of course. But it would never... But all this madness... Facebook. Right, from Facebook. I'm like, whoa. So I'm very careful. When I see people writing things, I mean, oh, my God, what's going to happen now? <laughs> so it's very it's dangerous. It's There's it's a dangerous. life lesson here. Yeah. When you're putting things on Facebook walls, yeah. be very careful. Yeah, it's crazy. You never know you might piss off. Yeah, it's crazy. There's some fucking crazy people out there. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> but all that. So on my on my DBS now, when I have a DBS, because guess what he done? He went and got a two year injunction on me. <laughs> 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 he got a two year injunction on me that I wasn't allowed to come anywhere near him within yeah, hundred yards. Yeah. <laughs> so I looked like a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> So, if you're new to Gary, his stories go fast. Wow. I mean, they're like, the pace is right there. If you watch part one, you will see we were just sat here like, what's going, what the fuck is going to happen next? <laughs> <laughs> but just to slow it down a, a minute yeah. then. How have the responses been then since you came on a few months ago to uh, the vi video? Unbelievable. Uh, so, when when you, what, how you do it, you put up sections and it's to punch. It gives a punch so people, they, they get in straight away. I didn't get, I understand that. Like that one, um, you know, what happens to sex offenders in prison? Yeah. Like that one. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's a punch. And so, and when you do it in sections and what, what I would advise anyone, any, any podcast that you watch, watch the whole thing. You know, these punch things, they're, they're great because they get you in, but then go and watch it the whole lot. So you get, you get people contacting you Ah, full of shit, all this. Uh, but they're, they're doing it from a blank, you know, a blank thing. That's great. Crack on, have a nice life. But a couple of them done it. And I said, look, mate, you know, I'm I'm telling the story. People know who was there. I'm telling the truth. I wouldn't stand up and tell a load of bullshit because I'm going to look like an idiot. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to do that to myself. I said, so please watch the whole lot. He come back to me and said, I apologise. Oh yeah, I apologise. I should have watched. Good. I should, and and, yeah. and a few of them done that. Yeah, but you know, some people reached out to me. There was one woman on the comments. If you go back to the the thing, you can see it. It's like she's wrote a book. I thought I was the only person that you know. You're the mal version of me. I was like, come on, book love. <laughs> <laughs> so I spoke to her. I spoke to her. I got on the phone to her. We had a chat. We had a good chat, and uh, she's doing some great things with her granddaughter. The granddaughter's playing for West Ham. She's kept her away from all this you know, the life that she's had and, and pushed her into doing something positive. And so that's great. And then, you know, I, I was contacted by, uh, oh, Sean. So I've got this group called London Giving where everyone gives and we go out to the homeless. People donate uh, sleeping bags, uh, clothes and all things like that. It's on Facebook, London Giving. And I've had this for four years, you know, a weekend thing. So I go out and I feed the homeless and, and give them clothes what people have donated. I was giving out some clothes at Tower Hill to this bloke. And he's looking at me strangely. And then he said, I know you are. I just watched you on Sean Atwood. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and then he went and wrote on a comment. Oh, you know, sweet. I went and wrote on a comment, but I'll tell you another thing about someone yeah. from this. Yeah. So anyway, so but some people, one young bloke contacted me. 
he's got himself mixed up in some crime, but he's got a disability, and he's it, it's affecting his it, the, the way that he is and that, and he's a bit scared of going to prison about it. So I explained it all to him, you know what I mean, and, and we spoke for hours. And he and then he went and wrote another comment. Jesus Christ, this geezer is unbelievable. But <laughs> I will help you. Do you know what I mean? Women contacted me from all parts of the country with some of the craziest stories I've ever heard. I'm like, okay, you're coming on my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> but it's helping them to and understand. The YouTube channel is called Product of a Postcode. The link is in the description box. Mm. Please go down and sub and support Gary's work over there. Yeah, but it's just about helping people. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And so because until they hear, uh, you know, these these stories, we don't quite connect what's going on in our lives. Do you know what I mean? You just think, oh, it's happening to me. It's a well, me. It's not. It happens to a lot of people. And so people talking about these things, it helps. And one of the things that I found from from your platform, there's so many people out there that have, you know. People's even said to me, Gary, I'll help you make a film. I don't want to make a film. Do you know what I mean? It's been unbelievable. The response has been unbelievable. Been unbelievable. That's it's really great. good to hear because that's our mission, you know. But a... One of the things that I would like to address, so a lot of your readers, so I'm Gary Hutton. I'm not Mickey Flanagan's Gary Hutton who wanted to, <laughs> what is it? Wanted to, oh, the most ambitious kid in the class wanted to drive a van. If he would have said he wanted to nick the van, I would have said, yeah, it's me. <laughs> but I don't know Mickey Flanagan. So the story was, right, oh. Mickey Flanagan's famous comedian, his first joke was about a geezer called Gary Hutton that went to school with him, most ambitious kid in the class, right? Brilliant joke. But people think it's me. So I'm the only Gary Hutton in the East End of London. So one night I was walking along and my phone was going mad and he was on this Saturday night comedian show telling this Gary Hutton joke. And so my phone goes mad. I'm like... So one of them was my cousin. So I asked, I said, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? He went, Gal, you've got to watch the telly. I said, what for? He said, there's a geezer who went to school with you. He's telling jokes about you. I said, what's his name? Told me his name. I said, I don't know him. <laughs> he said, you must do. He's talking about you in class. I said, I don't know him. So I'm getting all these messages. So I go home and I look at this geezer on, on Google and I'm like, no, I don't know him. I 100% don't know him, right? I have no clue who he is. But through Google him, I find out his agent's number. Next morning, I phone up and I say, uh, "I say, uh, hello, mate. I've got an inquiry about Mickey Flanagan. Oh, he's a great comedian. But I said, yeah, he's, he seems really good. He's just like, I said, yeah, he seems really good. He's going to go big. He's going to be brilliant. I said, yeah, great. I said, but I've got a, like a query. He said, what's that? I said, I said, my name's Gary Hutton. Hello, gal. I'm like, oh, he must know me as well then. <laughs> he must know me as well. So I said, oh, hello. I said, what it is, right, I want to know where I know Mickey from. Maybe I forgot or something like that. He said, of course you know him, gal. He's from Bethnal Green. <laughs> I said, well, look, I'm the only Gary Hutton in the East End of London. I said, so I don't know him, right? I don't know him. So he said, okay, I'll get in contact with Mickey and I'll give you a call. Next day, my phone ring. Hello, Gary. I thought, ah, you don't know me. <laughs> I'm no longer gal. You don't know me. <laughs> so he said, Mickey said... You can have tickets to any venue around the country, front row seats. I said, no, I don't want that. I don't want to know if I know him. So and then I took it. I don't know him. But all over the years, people have been saying to me, even comments in like on your platform. I oh, saw. I was like, what are yeah. these people on about? Yeah. So even on Mickey Flanagan's page, yeah. uh, Gary Hutton's real. Go and watch uh, Sean <laughs> Atwood. He's on there. He's real. <laughs> I'm like, God. You know what I mean? So Mickey Flanagan did grow up in the East End. He did live in one end of Brick Lane. He lived in the north end of Brick Lane. I lived in the south end of Brick Lane. It's a very long road. He went to a different school to me. He went to a, a Protestant school called Dankford. I went to a Catholic school in Bethnal Green, you know, just around the corner from his school, called St. Bernard's. Mickey Flanagan is older than me. <laughs> Work it out. Can't have a look at his date of birth, my date of birth. So I was never in his class. So, Mickey Flanagan, you're brilliant. But he's going to have a little bit of an end to that. So, he was in the comedy club and uh, up the, up the uh, Leicester Square. So, my mate is the bouncer. And he says, and I went to school with him. He was in my class. He said, Gal, phone mate. He said, Gal, come up to the comedy club tonight. I said, no, I'm busy. He said, no, Gal, you've got to come up. Mickey Flanagan's here. He said, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a giggle with him. So, I went up there. But unfortunately, the kid got cancelled. Oh. I don't know why. I'm oh. not going to say why. I don't know. But Mickey Flanagan, if you're out there, you want to contact me, you want to do something with charity with Gary Hutton, who actually didn't want to drive the van, he wanted to nick it. 
You know, we can do something and make something out of it because it's done well. Mickey, brilliant. Well done. So that lays that matter to rest. Yeah. What? The comments are going to keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People go say they're going to see him. They say, I'm going to see your mate tonight. I got, and now I just go, oh, have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Before the next crazy story from your life, then, what do you think of Mr. Fish? So, crash. How's your father? How's your father? <laughs> no, so, brilliant. And, and he wants to do something positive. Yeah, uh, the, what the, a good you know, guy. But he's got it off. He, you know, He's, he's getting people to watch him. You know, you've got to have a tagline. Mine is product of a postcode. He's his crash. There's your father. So, you know, but that's it. He's getting it out there. Brilliant, Jim. When everyone was so serious and he just came in and just made us all laugh yeah. our heads off. No, it's brilliant. It was and the it's faces brilliant. and everything, the voices. But once he gets serious, he's got a good message. Yeah. yeah he's got a good message yeah. and he should build his platform. You know, I'm not sure if he's right to go into schools and, and talk to kids. Crash. I mean, you'd probably <laughs> frighten them, but yeah, no, it's he's, he's, he's great what he's doing. Good luck to him. So if you've not seen our podcast with Mr. Fish, it is called Crazy Gay Black Armed Robert in Drag. And we will put the link to that in the description box because people are so serious with this lockdown stuff right now and yeah. they're losing their minds. Laughter. Humor gets you through some dark moments, and yeah. this guy will this guy will make you laugh, guaranteed. All right, then. So there was a time when you got stabbed six times in one sitting. Yeah, what happened there? So, um, so you know, some people can write a book about one situation in their life. You know, so being stabbed to me, it was normal. It was only later in life that I thought, this is not right. Do you know what I mean? Because I was suffering trauma all my life. You know, the first time I may have told you last time, the first time I ever got stabbed was by my sister at 10 years of age. She stabbed me in the arm. So being stabbed was like, okay, you know, it's not, I thought these things was, you know, that's what you just move on, you, you know, the next thing. It, you know, actually, it was safer to be on the street than actually be in my ass with seven traumatized, you know, brothers because of the trauma we went through. So they all suffered trauma, I suffered trauma. It was safer to be outside and away from them because, you know, they was roughing me up and doing things to me, you know. And so people could write one thing about being, you know, just being stabbed, for instance, you know, and how it affected their life and all that. And, and you know, I pray they get over it. But to me, it was just, okay, tomorrow's another day. Let's move on. That happened yesterday. But thinking about it, when I got a bit older and I'm writing a book, I was like, how the fuck am I alive? So what happened was I was in the pub in uh, Bethnal Green and uh, a big fight went off. Nothing to do with me. And so I went and sat outside and the wall it all calmed down. Do you know what I mean? People were getting dragged out, blah, blah, blah. I'm just sitting there. I'm talking with a pal. So we're talking and talking and talking. Now it's all gone quiet. The pub's shut and everything. We're still sitting there talking. We've had a drink. We've been out all day. And uh, we're talking and I'm looking at him and he's looking over my shoulder. And I'm like, what's he fucking looking at? So I turn around and see these group of geese, about 15 of them, all standing there with blades. And so I got up and I stood up and I went, I said, what's happening? And they went, you was in that pub? And I went, yeah, I was in that pub. I said, there's nothing to do with me, though. They've come back to do the people that they was fighting with. Right, I said, there's nothing to do with me, though. And I felt a bit of wind, right? But this was my mate taking off. <laughs> <laughs> so I've stood there. <laughs> I've stood there. And... uh one geezer come towards me, right, and he he he, he went to to stab me, and he he caught me in the arm. Ooh. So I put my arm against my chest Ooh. like that. I went like that because he was aiming for my chest, and I went like that. And went yeah. smash, right? Caught me there, right? But I didn't realise. So because at the time when you're getting stabbed, they just feel like punches, right? Even though I see the knife, it wasn't like a, a stab or anything like that. And then now they ran me. One does me in the spine. <sighs> Right, and so I go to kick one of them, bang, bang, bang in the legs, <sighs> right, and I'm like, whoa, and they stab it like, and then all my, I had a shirt on, right, I looked like Robinson Crusoe because one of them had a Stanley blade, and the shirt was all like this, it was all cut to ribbons, right, my trousers was cut to ribbons, but these was like little scratches, like they was just doing my clothes, which was lucky, and then so I'm still like, I don't know what's going on, right. 
And then they just disappeared. As soon as, as quickly as they turned up, they just run off. Right? And I'm, I'm standing there. So I'm like, what, what's happening? So I, I walk along the street and I can hear, pss, 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 pss. I'm like, what the fuck's that? I'm looking down at myself and this is going, look. Fuck off. Yeah, and mm. the blood's coming out and it's oh. putting it's firing out, right? So I wrap it up, right? I wrap it up and stop the blood from coming out of it. Yeah. And but I'm a I'm a little bit like, what's going on? Do you know what I mean? And then I'm feeling wet. There's all <sighs> blood around my ass and everything. Do you know what I mean? My trousers are all cut and I can see all blood out of my legs. And so I, I went to a pub door, I went to a, another pub around the corner. And basically they saved my life. Because what happened was the person who owned the pub. Like, I knew him, his wife bandaged my arm up with a uh, beer mat, like uh, mats. She put, yeah, she put them all around there and they took me to hospital. Uh, a vessel had been done in my arm. Oh. Yeah, it'd been done in my arm, but it was pouring, pouring out. Oh. But see, I just thought, you know, that's it. Do you know what I mean? That's what happens. But realizing later, you know, I put my arm up. That stopped me from getting stabbed in the heart. Could have gone in the heart. It yeah. could have went in my heart. I could have been dead. I couldn't be talking here today. Do you know what I mean? For something I never knew. I never knew nothing about. But the geezer, he went. He went on to another club and said, "Has anyone seen Gary Hunt?" <laughs> <laughs> I met up with him the next day, and he, I had all bandages on and everything. But I just moved on. I thought nothing of it. It was only afterwards when I'm writing a book, I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I could have been dead. <sighs> I could have been dead. You know what I mean? It, it, it's it's that close and, and knives. So. All my experiences in life, uh, I take them and, and use them as learning tools. So I, I made a documentary about knife crime, and it was it won a National Charity Film Award, which you can see. Uh, Did you put that scene in it? No. So what I done was it was a young boy that I because I, I went on to coach football with kids and semi pro football, and it was a young boy I was uh, working with at the time, really nice kid. He ended up getting stabbed to death. But one of the things that was poignant with me, he got stabbed in the heart and the knife broke off in the heart. Oh. And that was like me. Wow, that could have been me. And so I made one of the most powerful documentaries because I wanted people to understand knife crime, but the effects of knife crime and what it does to a family. So I'm, I'm in it for about 30 seconds. It's a mother talking about the loss of her child and how, and, and what happened. Do you know what I mean? The people went to court, but they got, they got let off because of certain reasons. You know what I mean? But they... You know, they know who done it. But yeah, young Barty, it's a, uh, please go and watch this video. Where can people watch that? Uh, it's on it's on the, the uh, Product of a Postcode TV. You can just go and watch it on there. It's on your YouTube channel? Yeah, it's on the YouTube channel, Product of a Postcode TV. Okay, okay. Wow. Uh, where the link could be involved, but you can go and watch it. It's yeah. so powerful. Uh, schools use it. Mm. Anyone want to understand in the effects of knife crime? I mean, yeah. it, won a, it won a National Charity Film Award. How long is it? Uh, it's 10 minutes long. Do you want us to add it onto the end of this video? Yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you. Okay, we yeah, can I'll do send that. It to yeah, you. But it's a very powerful story. I mean, pe people watch it and they cry. Yeah. I because it imagine. shows you the real effects of knife crime. Yeah. See, knife crime is a real, you know, you know, I do a lot of work in schools. People, to, to understand knife crime, you have to understand fear. Hmm. So a lot of young people carry knives through fear. Because I know he's got one over there. I better have one because if if I have trouble with him and I ain't got a knife, so you've got it on you for fear. And so when you're, you know, when you've got it out and you're waving it about, you're actually saying, and I tell kids this in workshops, you're actually saying, stay away from me. I don't want you to come near me. Stay away from me. Yeah. But then you get too close and I do it to you because I'm, it's fear. But you're actually saying, stay away from me. Keep away from me. That's what it is. That's what you're saying because you're in fear. Yeah. But then you you know, you use it because out of fear you've used it and someone ends up getting dead. And a lot of young people don't understand the biology of the body. You could stab someone thinking, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stab him there. There's great big arteries there. I'm dead. They don't understand it all. So when I do workshops around knife crime, I tell them about the body. Do you know what I mean? Understand where people can get stabbed. Where You know, because it's dangerous. They do it out of fear. And when you're doing stuff out of fear... Because a lot of these young people, they live a, they live a life in fear. They, they're growing up in trauma. Can you imagine the effects of knife crime, right, on young, you know, they're 15, 14, 15, 16, 17, in, in 25 years' time, mm. when they realise, I oh, watched this geezer being stabbed in front of me and they killed him and they got him. There's going to be loads of people. All these kids are going to be suffering with trauma. It's all right doing videos now. Yeah, bad, I'm bad. But in 20 years' time, when that comes back and it's you, mm. 
you know, you're watching people getting stabbed and things like that, and you're stabbing people. All this affects, it's all trauma. It's all trauma. Yeah, so go and watch that video. So it's a, a really good documentary. I've got a question then about the day you were stabbed six times. Yeah. So you told them, yeah, I'm in the pub, nothing to do with me. Do you think their motive was then either A, they just didn't believe you, or B, they were just hyped up like animals and they wanted in a revenge frenzy. on they anyone? They was in a frenzy yeah. because when they run away, they were shouting, come on, let's go and do someone else. <laughs> Seriously. You know what I mean, let's go and do someone else. And I was like, you go that way, I'm going this way. <laughs> pure frenzy. Yeah, pure, yeah. pure frenzy. Pure fr but see, I've got photographic memory. And so I see one of these blokes in a pub later on. I was with a few few geezers. Really? Yeah. And what happened then? He went home safely. <laughs> yeah, he went home safely. <laughs> All right. So the next, um, we, we're going to go back to your younger years. You've got some mischief stories, some funny yeah. stories, and some very dangerous ones. So, yeah. So I was, I was really mischievous. Do you know what I mean? There was no boundaries in my life. So... I'm, uh, one story is unbelievable. So, mum, I told you, my mum was, uh, she's suffering from leukemia. Mm. And we used to have a medicine cabinet, right? But at the time, I'm not connecting. These are tablets for, I'm not understanding that. You know, I'm, I'm six years of age, but there's a medicine cabinet. And my brother woke me up one night and he said, come, we're going to go and eat some sweets. So I said, well, they're sweets. So, yeah, but they're up there. So I climbed up, took the padlock off. And we're sitting at the table, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And we're taking these tablets. But we're making too much noise now. We're laughing. And so the parents come down. What are you doing? No, it's all right because we shared them equally. <laughs> we had to go to the hospital and get pumped out. Oh. <laughs> so I think that may have had an effect on me. You know, so <laughs> I, I was just so mischievous. How old was that? I was six years of age. Six, wow. So, but I was so mischievous. Do you remember changing rooms? Changing the rooms. Program, the program, Changing no, Rooms. There's no. a program. They help you change your, your, your living space. So you don't have to move. Right. And they help you change your living space. So one day, me and my brother's in the back garden, and there's a fence just, you know, between the back gardens. And there's a woman, she's gone out shopping, but she's left her back door open. So we climbed in a, over her garden and went in her ass. So the television's there. It's now put over there. There's pictures there put over there. We changed the whole room around, right? We changed the whole house around, right? So... We see her coming back from shopping. So we, we go in the back. I said, come quick, go in the back garden. And she walks in with her shopping and goes, ah, who's changed my house around? <laughs> <laughs> and she's shouting for her husband, she screaming, probably, what have you done to the house? <laughs> that's the thing the Manson family yeah. would do, things uh, like that. <laughs> because one of the things, one of the things, that, why I'm talking about things like this, one of the things in the comments was, you know, Gary's had t a terrible life, but there must have been some fun and games. There was fun and yeah. games. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There was there was laughable moments. Do you know what I mean? But then there was terrible moments. Yeah. So I, I was a mischievous young boy. Do you know what I mean? That just wanted to have a laugh. And, you know, I was inquisitive. I was inquisitive. I just wanted to do things for a laugh. And that got me in trouble. That got me in trouble. What dangerous things did you do inadvertently as a young person? Well, there's a story, right? And it's quite, it's, it's quite sad and it's terrible. Mm. So uh, there used to be a thing called a Red Bus Rover. And used to, it was like a, an Oyster card. You top it up. But it was 50p, something like that. And you can go on buses all day long, jumping on and off till 12 o'clock at night. Wow. So we used to buy one of these and go all around London and see what we can create. Might be a pound note there, might be a pound note. Be, and so we used to do it as young kids. And it used to get us out, right? And so we got the last bus back to uh, Allgate. Uh, bus garage it's 12 o'clock at night so now we're walking along Whitechapel towards Whitechapel and as we come out of the bus garage there's there's four or five geezers standing around a car with a boot open so there was three of us right but I'm talking like I'm 11 12 years of age and they say to me uh, go on crossing over I ain't, I ain't walking near them blokes like my two mates I said fuck it I'm walking through them I don't give a fucking shit so I walked through these geezers. One of them grabs me and shouts, put him in the fucking boot. And they start hitting me with rolled up newspapers, right? And they're hitting me and hitting me. And I grab onto a, a lamppost and I'm screaming. I'm looking at my two mates standing across the road going, look, all right? These geezers are trying to drag me into the boot, oh, right? Shit. And they're hitting me and hitting me and hitting me, kicking me. Get off the fucking post. Get off the post. They're trying to put me into the boot. Anyway, I start screaming and that. And then my mates start screaming and they all jump in the car and they drive off and go. But I clocked one of them. 
And there's a story you can go and Google, Jason Swift. So Jason Swift was taken by a paedophile gang in Hackney and they used to take him to have their sex parties and then they dumped his body in uh, in Essex somewhere in a field. But they was going around the country taking boys from fairs and everything like that. So when I'm processing my life, at the time I just walked on. When that happened, I walked on and just, we walked on and thought nothing of it. It was just another day in the life of, and thought nothing of it. But afterwards, so the geezer, the main geezer, his name was Cook. And uh, he was he was the leader of this paedophile gang. And they wanted to let him out of prison. And uh, But every community he went to, he got chased out. And they was holding him in a cell in a police station in the east end of London. And they was going to let him out to, into Tower Hamlets, into, you know, safe housing or a hostel or anything like that. I went and sat outside there and I'd done a protest for 24 hours. If you say, you bring this man out, then he's going to get hurt. And I sat out there with one of my pals. And then lots of parents come out there and we made a protest because I knew how dangerous they was. Do you know what I mean? Because he, he tried to kidnap me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He tried to kidnap me. And so, but at the time, it's just, carry on. Just, fit, you know, forget about it. But when I was writing the book, I was like, Jesus Christ, this is crazy. So this Jason crazy. Swift was one of the people victims. who tried to kidnap you. No, he was the victim. Oh, he was a victim. The victim was a young boy. Cook was the guy who Cook, tried to kidnap yeah, you. Yeah, Cook. And, uh, and and Jason Swift was abducted and murdered after yeah. they abused him. Yeah, after they abused him, they was taking him to sex parties. He was oh. a runaway from from home, and a young boy they took from a fair. There was there was a group of them. There was a paedophile ring. There was a group of them, and so when I'm processing all this later on in life, I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I'm so lucky to be here. Yeah, I'm so lucky to be. I'm so thankful. That lamppost saved my life. So say a kid like just ran away from home today and just ran off into London. Would something like this, is, is it likely to happen to them? Yeah, so I, so I, I do a homeless thing I told you about, London Giving. And so I come across a lot of young people. And because of the way I am, you know, the life that I've led, I say to them, look, if you don't sort yourself out, someone's going to pick you up and you're going to end up on the gear, you're going to end up a prostitute, especially young women. I come across so many young women, it's unbelievable. And I, and I try to advise them. Do you know what I mean? Get, this is not a safe place. You know, once upon a time, if you, especially if you went up the West End, that's where all the runaways went. So straight away. So I say to, I tell people this, right, and I've done it with my partner. Uh, I say, where do paedophiles go? Well, I'll ask you this question. Where do they go? They're going to go where kids where are. Where kids like are. Hot care homes yeah, and exactly. schools, churches. But also to the seaside because they're half naked. Seaside. So I was telling my partner this, right, and I said, we're going to the seaside. I said, I guarantee you we'll see someone at the back with a camera, right? Because I do it all the time because I've, I've got kids. So, and I, I do it all the time. And so we was at the seaside and I brought up purposely. I said, look at that man with the camera. And he's got this big camera zooming on the beach. That's where they go. They have to go there to feed their fucking craziness. Do you know what I mean? They so have they're to be filming half naked kids yeah. just to get off. Yeah. Or maybe we're going to yeah. abduct the kids as yeah, well. Yeah, or taking pictures. But you see them there all the time. Because they have to be random. Yeah. They're going where kids are. They're going where kids are. And so, you know, you know, my, my, I believe everything in my life has happened to me to, to be able to do what I do today because I take all the knowledge that I've gained. Do you know what I mean? I, and, and I use it in a positive way. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a really, uh, you, you know, the pedophiles on, uh, pedophile hunters yeah. on uh, Facebook. I think we've got a, a pedophile hunter coming on soon. Yeah. I've and spoke to Stinson Hunter. Oh, right, Stinson, he, he yeah. He said he might do it as well. Yeah. Yeah, 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 he's got a big platform. He does some good work. Yeah. I think he was one of the people that started it off. He was, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. So there's a, there's groups on Facebook, and so they come up on your news feed. And uh, one night I was watching one of them, but I'm looking at this video and I feel, I know that ass, I know that street. That looks familiar. So I'm sitting there watching it, and they're, they're knocking on this geezer's door, and telling him what he's done but then he flips and says well, I'm going to make a phone call and I'm watching this on my phone and I'm thinking so I start to walk out of my house and I'm still watching it on the phone I get in my car because I'm going to go there right because I want to see this unfold and while I'm watching it this geezer makes a phone call this car pulls up these geezers jump out baseball bats now all these hunters they're getting chased up the street and half of them are women so I go there get there quickly and I stop the geezer I said to the geezers mate your pal's phoned you, but he's actually a paedophile. I said, they've got evidence, and you want to smash them up. You want to kick his door off and smash him up. Do you know what I mean? 
And so that I met a paedophile group. And so I've been following them and they send me stuff and I help them out. I write stuff up for certain ones of them. But this one, Stacey and Vinny, they do a fantastic job. Uh, 20, 28, 8, uh hunting community. And they do a fantastic job. And so Vinny sent me a link the other day. He said, Gail, you've got to watch this. This is this happened a couple of days ago. And so it empowered me to do a live video. And I sat in front of, you know, on Facebook and I'd done it. I said, people, you've got to watch this. It's unbelievable. So this bloke's online talking to kids and what he wants to do is a 12-year-old boy. And what he wants to do to him, and you know, and the boys, they, they, but he's, it's it's it, it's a a decoy. a decoy, and you do know I'm twelve years of age. Yeah, that's fine. I need a twelve year. He basically he wants to do sexual stuff to this kid, but while he's doing it, he wants to dig knives in them to see how it feels. This bloke turns up to a park with six knives, but the people know that he's got the knives on him, and they don't touch him. They let him sit down. They talk him through it. They make him admit what he's done. And then when the police come, the police search him. These knives, you see these knives, they're big daggers. And then the bloke explains, I've got kids, wives, and all this, that, and the other. This man should never, ever see daylight ever again. The Predator had a wife and kids. Yeah. He should never see daylight ever again. It's crazy what's happening And what did happen to him? So now he's going through the process. The police turned up. They've arrested him. Now he'll go to court. And I hope he gets some sort of, you know, determinate sentence that he never, ever comes out ever again. Because this man is a danger. So a preference, a sexual preference, it's like me saying to you, Sean, right, you cannot look at a blonde woman ever again in your life, but your preference is blonde women. It's like you saying to me, I can't do it. I'd go, shut the fuck up. These, pre- they're, they're wired wrong. They've got a preference for young boys, young girls. That's their preference. You can't cure this. You can't cure this. This can't be cured. A prison sentence does nothing for it. It doesn't happen because it's a preference. So if you said to a heterosexual man, you cannot go near a woman for the rest of your life, he'd go, get the fuck. Ain't happening. You can't tell these people they're not allowed to, to go and find and sort out children because it's their sexual preference. And there's different, there's different things that they do. So if someone, a lot of them have been abused. If they've been abused, it depends what they, then it goes on to the way that they've been abused. Depends what they do to kids. Some of them just do touching. Because that's their first sexual experience where they was touched. So that's all they do. They think that's sex. Some of them penetrate because they was penetrated. And that's their first sexual preference. That's their learning around sex. So this is why they do it. So you're never going to stop this. Mm. So when you get older, these people, you never come out. And this is our mission on this channel. End the war on drugs. Take all those resources and put that into going after these predators. Not letting them get these high-priced lawyers and these fancy connections come in so they get little slaps on the wrist so they can have hundreds of victims like Sins of My Father. Have you seen that on Netflix? Yeah, yeah. Hundreds of victims. It's unbelievable. Babies and shit. It's unbelievable. It's madness. And But this is a preference. It ain't going to stop. So the, the, the sentencing for these people must be determined. You never let these people out. Never let them out. Busy for shaking down kids for weed. Yeah. And saying you, can't, you haven't got the resources. Go after yeah. these predators. Mm. It's crazy. It's mad. Are you familiar with Chris Hansen to Catch a Predator? Yeah, the American one. So we had yeah. him on Outward Unleashed on Wednesday night. Oh, brilliant. I haven't yeah, seen that one. interviewed him. Yeah. I have seen that yeah, one. Yeah. He gets him to come in the house, doesn't he? And he comes, yeah. out, he comes out of a cupboard or somewhere. Oh, man, his videos are so yeah. addictive. Yeah, they're good. And I've the cops them. are all around the building. Yeah, I've watched them. He came on with um, the son of Peter Nygaard, who is a victim, and he's, he's uh, suing his own dad because Nygaard had this pedo island like Epstein. Oh my God. So he saw, he, he realized, he said he was at a meal one night and he saw his dad with this little girl and he just realized this this, this guy's a fucking monster. See, but what, what the, 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 the trauma that they create in young victims is unbelievable. It's unmeasurable. You destroy people's lives, but you know what? You end up destroying their kids' lives and their kids' lives. Someone has to break the chain and, and get serious help because you destroy people. It destroys people's sexual abuse. Yeah, it does. And a lot of the people who've been to prison have had childhood trauma, sexual or physical, yeah. and that's caused that whole chain yeah, reaction of getting involved in drugs, crime, exactly. take the drugs because they can't deal with what's happened, self-medication, yep. pay for the drugs, yep. robbery, drug trafficking, or if it's a woman, they go into sex work. Exactly. But they've all suffered a trauma. And I said to you last time, prison, prison, 95% of the people in prison have all suffered a trauma. Yeah. And they're acting out, being violent, taking part in crime. You know, th- this is a serious issue. 
yeah. the trauma that people go through, but don't understand that all their decision making is made through trauma. Yeah. How can that be right? Yeah. You know, you've got to step back and start to realize I suffered. Do you know what I mean? All my decision making, I was violent. I was taking part in robberies. I was doing this. I was doing that. It's because you was living a life of trauma. You know, every, your, your, your growing up affected you so much, but you're blinded by it. It's, it's, it's almost hidden. And then you wake up one day and you think, Jesus Christ, my whole life's been traumatic. Of course it's been traumatic. Look at the things you've been up to. Yeah, which leads me to my next question then about sex workers because the sad lives that they lead. So just the other day, I interviewed a crime profiler out of America on a live stream. This is um, Darkest Net. If people want to watch this, I think this is Darkest Net uh, episode six. And, the, and, and while I was interviewing him, a serial killer who he is working with to get um, find out where more bodies are. This, this guy's killed over 50 sex workers. The serial killer called the phone and we, we were able to ask the serial killer questions live on YouTube. I don't know if this has ever been done before, but the, the audience were asking him questions as well. So this is a, a massive black guy called Delmus who was a truck driver, had a girlfriend, took his holidays with his girlfriend, lived a normal family life, but when I've seen a documentary on him. Yeah, but when yeah. a sex worker would approach his truck, if he was sleeping yeah. or if he felt disrespected, um, he would just say, Yeah, come here and snap the necks, throw them in the back, and he would just drive to a different state, get rid of the body, drive to another state, get rid of the clothes. He was pulled over twice by the cops with the cops in the back. Wow. Cops was like, you got anything in the back? He's like, No. But how how you know, how um he was just laughing and how cold and evil. Yeah. This guy was an absolute monster. But he, if you took that out of the, what he'd done, mm. you, you could say he would be a likable guy. Yeah. Um, no, but that's the thing. Most Some of the most dangerous people, you know, that, that are involved in violent crime are really nice people. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. Yeah. So I was in prison, right? And I met some of the craziest people. I'm going to tell you about one. Johnny Scripps. Google Johnny Scripps, right? Johnny Scripps would walk like this, right? He was six foot tall, and he would walk like this. He had a strange thing. He'd walk like this. Right. He wasn't nothing bad, but he just looked weird to me. And so someone said to me, Yo, you know, he's from, he was born in Wapping, but he moved out. Wapping's in the east end of London. So I thought, I'll have a chat with him. So I've gone in there. I want to find out about him. Right. So I've gone in his cell, and Johnny Scripps is doing knitting. But the knitting he's doing is all prison issue stuff, and he's got it all squares. So blankets, shirts, socks, pants, jeans, you know, everything you get prison issue, he's cutting them into squares and he's sewing them together, making a big blanket out of them. But I'm like, okay, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny Scripps gets home leave, right? And he goes to the Far East. Uh, where was it? Singapore, or somewhere like that. And he gets the death penalty. He's meeting backpackers, right? He, he's meeting backpackers, taking their money, and then putting, wrapping them up, he's killing them, wrapping them up, and he's putting them in in lakes and rivers and things like that. He got he got the the uh, the death penalty. These are the people I was in for a white collar crime. <laughs> These are the people that now I'm mixing with. They're dangerous people. One bloke, listen, one bloke. He says to me, um, so he's from the East End as well, right? But I don't know him. So he he says, "Gal, can I have a chat with you? We'll have a chat." So I said, "Yeah, no problem." So he says, we, uh, we have a guy in my cell, we have a cup of tea and we're sitting there talking. And he tells it to me exactly how I'm going to tell you it now. So I go, I've got this court case, right, what I'm in here for. So I say, yeah, he says. So my missus, she started going out on a Sunday. This geezer's like 40-odd, right? She starts going out on a Sunday and she's going out with her mates. She goes out to a Sunday club and she comes in a bit late. She's drunk and all that. And, the other. and I'm thinking... Okay, I can't see where the court case is. <laughs> what is the court case in this? So he says, one Sunday, oh, he said, one Sunday, girl, I had enough. I found out she was seeing a geezer. He tells me the geezer's name. I fucking know the geezer. He's been screwing his missus, right? But I go, look, okay, I'm going to tell him I know him, right? He says, uh, he goes, so one Sunday, I had enough. She's in the bedroom. She's in, no, she's in the bathroom, putting makeup on, you know, she's doing it. She's got the music on. And I say to her, you ain't going out today. And she says, I fucking am, I'm going out. And he goes, no, I know about the bloke, you ain't going out. He said, I walked into the bedroom, opened the drawer, pulled out a gun, went back in the box, and said, you fucking ain't going out. Shot her in the head. And that's how he told it to me. And I went, and he said, and what do you reckon I'll get? I said, look, do me a favour. They're, they're going to get you in front of some psychiatrists. 
tell them the way you said it to me, exactly the same way you said it to me. I said, you'd be all right, you get night off. <laughs> <laughs> because he was obviously crazy. He was obviously crazy. So he should have packed his bags and left and said, good luck to you, crack on. <sighs> but he shot her in the head. He'd never been involved in crime in his life. <sighs> never been in crime. At 40 odd years of age, he's never been in crime, but he goes and kills his wife. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Um, amongst the different murderers I interacted with in Arizona, there is a class of murderers that live completely normal lives. They come home and, for example, they find their wife in bed with another guy. Yeah. And they grab the gun and just shoot them both in that moment, crime of yeah. passion. And those guys were very well behaved from what yeah. I noticed. They like really regretted it. And No, but see, this geezer, he must have planned it because it's not as 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 easy to get a gun in, in, the, in, UK. England, in the UK. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. got one. You know, this geezer, he must have said, well, she's not going out this week and went and bought a gun. <sighs> yeah. And, and searched it out to go and get a gun. More psychopathic. Yeah. 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 Crazy. I remember this geezer. I've got to tell you, this is funny. So Sasha. Right, his name is Sasha and he's gay. I don't know where he is in the world now, but I used to have a laugh with him. But because I was a young boy, I was good looking, do you know what I mean? He, he sort of gravitated to me. And so I used to have a laugh with him and he used to go to me, Gary, I've been in top security prisons and things like this and you wouldn't believe uh, the people that I have sucked their cocks. And I was like, no, nah, listen, I don't want to know, right? I don't want to know. This guy has been in all the top security prisons, right? I don't want to know. And so... I said, nah, I don't want to know. So one day I'm walking along the landing and I can hear Sasha calling me. I'm walking in the opposite direction. And he's going, Gary, Gary. So I, said, I went, ah, leave me alone. And he said, no, Gary. So I turned around and looked at him and he had a bathrobe on. And he opened it up and he had stocking suspenders and everything. <laughs> right? He had all the gear on. And he said, meet me in my cell. I said, jog on. But Sasha, right? He ended up getting, uh, he masterminded a crime while he was inside and ended up getting another eight years on top of some art theft. But <laughs> so, but he, prison's crazy. It's crazy. So Sasha, this, this bloke turns up. So that must have been Sasha's routine. He's got into this geezer. Now this geezer's, they've, they've got a double cell, right? And one day, um, um, goes on a visit and this geezer's in front of me and he goes and sits down and he's got his wife, his kids, and he's laughing, he's joking, and all this, that, and the other. I'm looking at the, I, the person on the visit with me. I'm just going, look, what the fuck is going on? So as we're going back, I make sure I'm next to him. I walk back with him. I say to him, look, I said, I'm really confused, mate. I said, what's going on with you and Sasha? I said, because obviously your wife don't know. He said, no, she don't know that. But this is how I get through prison sentences. Sasha buys me everything. It doesn't put that, that thing, you know, that, that cost on my wife. He said, and so Sasha gets me everything I need, blah, blah, tobacco, this, that, and the other. I'm like, I've got to get the fuck out of here. Do you know what that's called in America? Fuck knows. <laughs> gay for the stay? Yeah. That's what it's called in America, that's gay crazy. for the stay? It's fucking yeah. nuts. It's yeah. nuts. When I see him with his kids and he's playing with his kids and his yeah. wife, I was just like, huh? Do you know what I mean? And when I had a chat with him and he's telling me this, I was like, no, mate, I'll give you some tobacco if you want some tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's crazy. A trans inmate was saying that um, some of the biggest, baddest, toughest dudes on the yards who, who were like, you know, they were mouthing off about hating gays yeah. were going to her for her yeah. services. And, no, I don't. And, and, and I you, find... see, you see family members visit, visiting girlfriends yeah. and wives, but they have no idea. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So I've got nothing against gays or anything no, like yeah, that. Yeah, I, mean, I even... find them quite funny. I have yeah, a good yeah, laugh of yeah, them. Yeah, Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. I have a good laugh of them. I, yeah, like, yeah. I like their banter and things like that. It's just that. interesting, the, yeah. the, the, the sexual, the yeah. levels of sex that go on in prison. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. Yeah. It's madness. Yeah, yeah. It's madness. But, you know, it was an eye-opener to me. But, yeah, I mean, I could write two, two three, four, five books about my stay in prison. Do you know what I mean? The people that I met, it was just like, wow. Do you know what I mean, what I couldn't get that. Why I was, I knew, you know, I know now, but I was, I, you know, some of the like B cats, the high security, but I should never have been in them. But I become worse than them people that was in there for a sentence that they done something bad. Yeah, I wasn't in there for a bad sentence. <laughs> I'm just becoming bad. <laughs> Did we talk about the most famous prisoners you met last time? Yeah, no. So I ain't into all that. Okay. Uh, so I'm not into dropping names. I wrote a book. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm not into dropping names and who I know and who I gotcha. don't know. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. to me, that's like, 
it, it's a syndrome. My cock's bigger than your cock. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? I've got a very little willy, but a very fast <laughs> bum that goes like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, getting back to my earlier question then, because... You're talking about these runaways, right? The girls, yeah. and they end up as sex workers. And mm. then they could meet someone like that serial killer. Yeah. And that serial killer's attitude was, these are just crack whores. No. He did not see them as human beings. No. And after he was off the phone, I said, look, these women have probably been abused as kids, yeah. thrown away, on the, raised on the streets. They got nothing, you know, in their lives. And they ended up on drugs because no one's helped them. Mm. They're self-medicating to yeah. deal with that. And then their the life has ended when they met this guy. Yeah. So for those kids in London then, and John Wedges spoke to us about this, what could be done to stop, to break that cycle for them? For these kids, these, these runaways, especially the females who yeah, are even it, more it, vulnerable? It's hard because they run away to get away from the abuse that they're, 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 they're suffering. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And that, they, they think it's a clean start. You know, I'll oh, get away, I can start again, I can pick my life up. You come to London, you can't do that. You can only do that if you've got money. It's out of the chip pen into the frame. Yeah, pen. you can't do that. And and see, so a, a predator will know a victim. A victim will know what a predator is. And they gravitate to each other. Mm. They gravitate to each other because that's all they know. Do you know what I mean? That's all they know. And so they end up in a darker place. It gets darker and darker and someone ends their life for them most of the time. And it's so sad. But this is not something. So, so how, how do we stop it? We have to go into people's homes mm. and catch these things early and watch the signs. You know what I mean? Because we know how these people come into people's lives. You know, we know how to. Right, so let's get there. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, predators look for single women, single mm. women with kids. Mm. Okay, let's break that then. Let's break that. Let's make it law that every single man that comes into a family has to have a, a passport that says he is this, 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 and this. He's not this, 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 and that. Make that law. Keep these kids, you know, keep them safe. They won't end up where they're going to end up. You know, running away from trauma and abuse and things like that. So, I mean, let's do that. The serial killer said he got away with it for so long because the police don't investigate the murders of sex workers no. as thoroughly as they do yeah. on normal citizens. And speaking to John Wedger, you know, he was analyzing this whole situation on the streets. Yeah. He was documenting um, the uh, kids who were becoming sex workers. And he was speaking to the older women. They were trying mm. to like, they were trying to like remedy the situation. He was working with the older women, sex workers, and they were trying to like remedy the situation. But Wedge's work just kept getting shut down from the top. Mm. So are these people, is, it, is this something that law enforcement views these people as just like disposable uh, people that are not worth the resources to protect? Right. So when I'm out doing homeless work and giving them stuff and clothes and food, I always ask them this question. How do you find your interaction with people in, on the street? And they say, and nine times out of ten, they will say, they don't even see me. I feel like of invisible. And so that creates, that gives you no sense of self-worth. I'm now invisible. No one gives a shit about me. Do you know what I mean? So anyone showing any little bit of, you know, oh, I want to help you, you'll go with that person. Someone, even the older sex workers, start getting these people vulnerable. Oh, look, I can get you off the street. We'll get you a few quid, but you have to do this. Okay, now she's a prostitute. And listen, you need a little bit of brand. If you feel, if it's getting bad, take a little bit of brand. So the older sex workers mm. are now providing new sex workers. You know, it, it, because you've got someone that's at the depths of darkness that feels worthless because no one is interacting with them. And so let's start interacting with these people. They're all human. They've all got a story. Let's start interacting. Let's do more for them. And so, you know, I sit there in a house. I've got clothes, warmth, food, and I sit there sometimes. And this is, this is documented. You can go on London Giving. This is documented. I come across a 65-year-old woman, and I was eating my Sunday dinner. I said to my partner, I can't eat this. Let's go and give it to her. Is she sleeping on the streets of London? And she's been there for years, 65 years of age. Someone's nan, someone's mum, someone's aunt, someone's brother, someone's sister. 65 years of age. And what this documented me going there in the pissing down the rain and saying to her, there's a Sunday dinner. And why I documented it, because people, if I was to tell this story, they go, it's bullshit. And there's no 65-year-old woman out on the streets of London. There's a fucking 65-year-old woman and I fucking met her. 
Do you know what I mean? This is bollocks. It's fucking bullshit. The government... These are human fucking beings. Fucking help them. You say you get them off the street. So I've got this thing called London Giving, right? And so they're saying, oh, yeah, we're putting all the homeless people in, in shelters during the pandemic. Bollocks, are ya? I fucking took a photo of fucking, ten, fucking tents. Do you know what I mean? You're full of fucking shit. Go and help these fucking people. Sorry. No, you're fine. With the, the, the passion, you know, it's um, a good thing. Mm. I wonder um, if we perhaps interviewed some people that were homeless, that are like actively in the lifestyle, so, if that would wake people up to the horror of yeah, what they're going through. Yeah, so there was one young girl, she's 35 years of age, and I, I'd done a little film with her on the street because I wanted to highlight the, what's going on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because people, you know, ah, there's no homeless. I'm talking to a 35-year-old girl. Mm. Right? She's living in a tent. And she's speaking about how she feels and things like that. And I put it up on social media. A documentary maker asked me to contact me. Can you tell us where she is? I said, no. And they went, why won't you tell us where she is? I said, because she might be hiding from someone. Someone might want her. She's been damaged. Do you know what I mean? She needs more than a documentary made about her. Mm. I've done it so that the government's here. I got time contacted by a homeless charity. So my, this is not a homeless charity, what I've, what I've set up. It's just people that want to give back. And they do outreach. Asking me... How do we do outreach? What? You're getting money funding from the from the government and you want to tell you want to ask me how do we do, how am I doing my outreach so successful? Jog on you nutter. So what I'm doing I'm I'm trying to raise 5000 pound for a van that we can convert into a shower, uh, making teas, you know, hot food. And so I'm willing uh, uh, once a pandemic finishes there's a just giving page on the London uh, thing is I'm willing to sleep on the street and document it for 24 hours, but leave my house with no clothes, leave my house with just what I've got on and then see what I pick up and see where it leads me and see who comes and, and gives me outreach and who don't give me outreach. Do you know what I mean? I want to see it for myself, so I'm going to go uh, homeless for 24 hours and, and really see what goes on. We'll put that link in the description box. Yeah. Speaking to you, Wedger, the serial killer, and other people, We've got to start shining a light on this. Yeah, it's terrible. More than we it's have It's terrible. Done. Yeah. It's terrible. These people are just left. I met a geezer a couple of weeks ago, God rest his soul. So I was helping this bloke every week I go out and I'm, I come across a young bloke called Gary. One leg on crutches and uh, he lost his leg. Uh, so he's fell through the system. You know, his leg's been amputated. He's was he a war veteran? No, he was, uh, no, he was just a young boy just a young boy but he can't get work and all things like that do you know what I mean and he's and he's fell through the system but I have met well veterans I have met war veterans with it they sit there I've got photos of them that I put on social media with their numbers please help I'm a, I'm a war veteran you know I've seen them I've come across them I spoke to them I give them uh, food every week and, and sleeping bags I phoned up a uh, uh, I won't mention the, the, the organisation but I phoned them up right, and I said look I'm coming across soldiers and they went you will never come across a soldier an ex soldier. I said, but I'm coming across them. They went, there's not, we go out every night and we find them. I said, well, you're not. But they was adamant that there's no soldiers living on the streets of the capital. I said, there is, mate. I've seen them, I've spoke to them. More than half of my friends in prison were vets. Yeah. But to getting back to this Gary, last week I went out to feed the homeless and clove them and found out he died. Oh, shit, man. Yeah, he found out he died last weekend. Did you find out how he died? Uh, the, the, the bloke that was, that was telling me uh, that sleeps in uh, an area close to him. He said, look, we just found him lying on the floor, fit and dying. Fuck yeah, and he man. died, so they don't really know. Yeah, I think we, we we need to find some people to shine a light on this and get put it on camera, what, what they're actually going yeah. through. Because we've not done that. It's yeah. all nice for us to sit in here. We, our lives yeah. are good. But yeah. to go and show I mean, some what of the, they're going some through, of the, I mean, drug I could, withdrawal. And I the, could find someone for you. Yeah. But I, I mean, some of the people I come across is just unbelievable. Yeah. And all different ages, all different, you know, it's it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Young kids, young girls. So I do, a, I, we, we give them a survival pack. People go on Amazon, we've got a wish list and we give them some, because people don't realise that women need 10 packs. They yeah. need everything. So we do a survival pack and sleeping bags wow. and give it to them. I mean, we've, we've raised quite a lot. We've raised 1,300 for a van that we want to buy. We want to buy a van, uh, raise five grand so yeah. that we can we can help them even more. Because these big charities, see, when I do something, I do it properly. Do you know what I mean? I don't want your money. I don't want it. Do you know what I mean? But together, we can make a difference. 
It's just pulling together, and that's why it's called London Giving, so we all give. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to make a donation to that, definitely. Well, you're going to actually uh, run the charity, uh, run the marathon. Oh, this marathon challenge. Yeah. You want to tell people what, what's yeah. going on here? So uh, the charity product of a postcode that I set up uh, and I'm the CEO of, we've got three places, three separate places for the London Marathon. So it's a virtual London Marathon this year. So you get uh, everything you need. So they give you a tag that you put in your shoes and it's registered from a satellite so that you've done 26 miles. How long does that take? It depends how fit you are and how fast you want to go. So I've done the London Marathon in 2000. Yeah. And uh, I wrote in my book, the human body's not designed to do the do a marathon. So, you know, I, I got... How long did it take you back then? That was 20 years ago? Yeah, 20 years ago. So I think it took me just under four hours. Okay. Yeah, just under four hours. What pace? Uh, a pace where my knee exploded. <laughs> <Man>. So <sighs> what we do is we raise money for our Dreams and ca Passions campaign. Yeah. So we fund young people's dreams and passions. So a boy we come across, uh, he was very academic and he wanted to become a vet. and But he lived in very, like, almost Kent, you know, deep, deep south, south east London. And the only veterinary college in London is in the Angel Island. And so the travel alone was £1,200. So this boy, when I come across him, a little bit streetwise, but very academically clever, and was going to fund it by selling drugs. Mm. So I said, that ain't happening. Right off to the charity, tell him you know, what, what's going on, and the Dreams and Passions campaign will fund it because this is your passion in life and your dream is to become a vet. So we paid the £1,200 got him a, a year's ticket, bought him some clothing, bought him some books, everything he needed to go to the college, and he finished his first year of merit. Wow, man, that's fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. One young boy, he was very he was very athletic, 400-meter runner, but he he approached the charity, look, his coach, he, he ain't got the stuff you know needed to take part, spikes and things like that, but he's very talented. Okay, can I come along to a training session? Yeah, you can come along. So I goes along to the training session. And I watch this young boy walk in, and he's all sad, and he stuffs in a carrier bag, right? And I thought, I watched him warm up. I said, yeah, I know what he wants. I said, my, the charity's willing to back him. They said, what are you going to do with him? I said, get an adult and him to meet me at a shopping centre uh, at 12 o'clock Saturday. Okay. I took him in the shopping centre Bought him trainers, mm. bought him kit, bought him a sports bag, mm. bought him everything he needed to take part. And uh, the 400 meter runner, uh, Abraham Shakes, the woman, I can't remember her name, something Abraham Shakes, she donated a 400 pound pair of Adidas spikes from her sponsor. Wow. Right. This boy went on to represent his county at 400 meters. Holy shit. Because now he's like everyone else. He's got the gear. He's walking into training. He's more confident. He's got all the stuff. That's all he needed. That's all he needed. So the Dreams and Passions campaign is to fund young people with their dream and passion. One young bo one young boxer, right, has just turned pro with uh, Frank Warren. Wow. He he was a good boxer. And he, uh, see, I don't tell people all this stuff, right, because it's not me. But for this, I will say it. Uh, he wanted to, he got the ABAs. He won a schoolboy ABAs. And then he got picked to box for England. Got to go around the country. Don't worry about that. We'll take cover of the fear. This boy now has just turned pro with Frank Warren. Holy shit. It's about funding young people's dreams and passions. We have got your back, Gary. Don't yeah. worry. So if you're willing to run 26 miles and make it your passion for the next, what is it, three, five, four months to October, uh, a lot of young kids will benefit from it. I was jogging until recently. I'll, I'll get back to it. Yeah. I like jogging. And so what we do is we'll set up a Just Giving page mm -hmm. and you can raise as little, as much as you want to fund young people's dreams and passions. Couldn't think of a better cause. Mm. We're going to get on that. So, all right. So the next story then is chucking petrol bombs from a great height. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so the process of writing this book, right, it made me realise that, you know, this was a trauma because I was willing at 10 years to age to throw petrol bombs 
a group of uh, people that was having a street fight. So what happened was, so I lived in Whitechapel and there was Bethnal Green just up the road. So there's nothing between it, a road called Valance Road where the Crays used to live. It's, it's, you know, half a mile long. And that's the distance. So a group from where I live knew that there was a party going on in this area. And so they went there and they had a fight. And one of the boys from where I grew up beat up this geezer. He doesn't like it and he's going to get all his mates and all this. And they're mods at the time, right? They're mods. And uh, it was a, not, not mods from the 60s. This was like, you know, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, so they get mods from all different areas and they're going to come where I live, Chicksand, right? Just off of Brick Lane. They're going to come there one night. It was bonfire night. They're going to come there and they're going to smash, every, smash everyone up. So where I lived, it was a very small estate. And there was only 15 young men there, 15, right? And four of them was my brothers, right? Four of them was my older brothers. And so I'm on a full floor of a balcony in a block of flats. And one of the older boys, without anyone knowing, has took us up there, me and another young bloke, we're like 10 years of age, and he's making petrol bombs and showing us how to make petrol bombs, all right? And we're standing, looking over the landing, and he says, right, what I want you to do, because I'm going to go down with them, what I want you to do, when they get to that giveaway sign in the road, they're all going to come along there. When they come along that giveaway sign, we want you to chuck petrol bombs at them, right? So well, I'm standing on this, and I can see from a great height, I can see people coming. But they continue to come, and they come, and they come, and they come. There's about five, 600 people, right? And they're singing, we are the mods, and it gets louder and louder, and I'm thinking... Fuck, my brothers are going to fucking die. They're going to get killed, right? And so before they get to this giveaway sign, I'm standing there with a petrol bomb. I'm about to throw it on this group of people. They don't know it's going to happen to them, right? But I'm willing to do it at 10 years of age, right? And I'm going to chuck a petrol bomb in, in and we're going to chuck more than one. And we're going to chuck it in amongst a group of 500 blokes. They're all going to be on fire and running about. But I didn't care at the time. didn't care. But one of my older brothers took it upon himself with two tools in his hand, right, to run at them. And so, and, but his mates don't know what he's doing and my other oh, brothers shit. don't know what he's doing. And he runs at them. And these people are walking and they stop. And, like, this one man's running towards them. And they're like, what the fuck? One person thinks, like, he must be fucking nuts. And so now his mates are all playing catch-up with him. And so this group of 500 people turned away and tried to get away and they all run. <laughs> and they all run. And these 15 blokes are now hitting them with hammers and beating them and bashing them and saying, don't come back round here. But I was willing to chuck petrol bombs on them at 10 years of age. So when I'm processing this later on in life, I can see the damage that it would have caused. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, the fuck, that's not normal. But my life wasn't normal anyway. But, you know, I was willing to throw a petrol bomb and more, multiple bedrooms in a grunt wow. amongst a group of 500 blokes. That would have caused carnage. That would have caused carnage. I probably want, they would have nutted me off. I'd be still in prison today because the amount of deficit would have caused. But I was willing to do that. You had a few questions coming, but before we go there, are there any crazy prison stories or prison fight stories that you've not told us yet? Uh, no, no. I think we've, we've, we've covered all that. Do you know what I mean? Okay. We've covered all that that I want to that I want to say. Okay. Do you know what I mean? We've we've covered that in the last one, and that, and that was you know, yeah, that happened. If you go and watch the other one, yeah, yeah, please go and watch part one if you've not seen yeah. it. It's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. All right. So there's two questions coming for you from the viewers. Gary, you're doing great work inspiring young people, but who inspired you? So that's difficult, right? That's difficult to say who inspired me, because. I, I went on a journey of discovery, right? And I'm an entirely different person to what I was. And so I, I've actually inspired myself, you know, because I don't look in at myself, right? So, I, and, I, you know, I've gone on to advise government bodies, set up charities, working in schools, prisons, all things like that. So I'm in the middle of it looking at, so I don't actually look at myself and go, oh, fuck me, you're, you're, you know, I don't see what I do. I just move on to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And that inspires me to just keep doing, 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 doing. And I want to do as much as I can for young people. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and so I see myself as an inspiration to myself. Just, I just want to keep giving. 
it strikes me as pure passion rooted in your own experience yeah suffering your maturity and everything you've been through yeah yeah so it's become my passion yeah and this is why we've got off because i know your passion will give you everything in life that you mm -hmm. need and this is why the charity funds young people's dreams and passions yeah because i know that the earlier you get hold of a passion mm -hmm. the more than likely you succeed in life yep so but some people can't fund their passion mm -hmm. okay we'll do that so i have set up a very simple charity <laughs> do you know what i mean with a very simple name that delivers what it what it what it intends to do mm -hmm. you know and it's being taken on by other people setting stuff up and doing exactly the same thing great brilliant well done you know well done so you know the charity i set up that stems from a dysfunctional life and understanding the dysfunctional life and the process that you need to go out you know i suffered great mental health you know my mental health was terrible and i say to people the one bit of advice that I give people when you're in a dark, dark time is that it doesn't last forever. Mm. It don't last forever. Nothing lasts forever. So when you're in the minx that crazy, crazy, your, your brain is running away with itself and you can't control it, it won't last forever. You just take a step by day, by day, by day, and it gets better and easier and easier and easier. Do you know what I mean? But you have to process your crazy life in a way where it's – you get to understand it. You know, it's understanding it that then helps you to move forward. And so I understood, I got to understand everything that happened to me. So I, I'd done things, I didn't know that professionals use it. I didn't understand. I'd done it myself. So one of the tools that I'd done, but I didn't know professionals use this. One of the things that I'd done, so I'd be going over my life, right, and I'd be, I'd be seeing dangerous situations and that, that have really affected me. So I got myself in my head, went and grabbed my own hand as a kid and took him over the park. And I went away from that. And I took him over the park. And now it's different. This young boy's playing in the park. He ain't chucking petrol bombs. So I, took, so I go in my mind. I went into my mind and I took myself away from it all and made something different happen. Do you know what I mean? Instead of madness and keep thinking about madness, I just took myself on a journey. What about if I went to the park and I didn't go open that door? I didn't walk into that situation. What about if I went that way? So I've done it in my head to make it, you know, now it's not going to affect me. I took it away. So you have to work. I mean, I didn't know professionals actually use that with people. Is that visualisation? Yeah, but I didn't understand what was going on, but it worked for me. And now I hear professionals talking about it, and I go, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that's why when professionals read my book, it gives them a good insight into a dysfunctional, you know, uh, mind of a young person, which they can't get, which they can't get. So the last question then is, what does Gary think about Prince Andrew? Right, so I'm an inquisitive person, and so I look into things. And one of the things that I found out is that, you know, when you go to court, in this country, you're taken to court by the Queen. Mm -hmm. And it's the Queen's counsel that prosecutes you. And it's the Queen's this, it's Queen's that. You get uh, bills from the, the, the Queen. And so there's a law that uh, the royal family, she can't prosecute them because she prosecutes us when we do a crime in this country. There's a law that you cannot be prosecuted, her family and herself cannot be prosecuted for any crimes. So, you know, when Harry left the royal family, it wasn't because of his wife and all things like that. Now you are susceptible to, to, to judgment. If you do something wrong now, I cannot protect you. So while Andrew is in this country, nothing's going to happen to him. He's, so now we take away your job. There's a mansion you can go and live in there. You're never, ever going to be prosecuted because the queen cannot prosecute herself or her family. And that is law in this country. So, Prince Andrew, you're an animal. Put your hands up and say, I've done it. You can't be arrested for it in this country. There's, there's victims out there. On the BBC documentary, he said he was going to give his full cooperation with the US authorities. Now the French authorities are also calling on him because they've arrested Jean-Luc Brunel, who procured um, Epstein, boasted he slept with over a 1,000 girls procured from Jean-Luc Brunel. And Virginia said that there was a party, let's just say, at the island that Prince Andrew was at with um, her 
and a bunch of East European girls who couldn't even speak any English and Prince Andrew. And do you think that he was just bluffing then about offering his full cooperation with the authorities? And he just, you know, so he, let me ask you a question. Do you think all these people are lying? The victims the and... Victims, do you think they're all lying? No, no, we've interviewed them. Yeah. We interviewed Mira Farmer before she got legally gagged and it's yeah. absolutely heartbreaking. So why is the only person in the world that thinks they're lying is Prince Andrew then? <laughs> Don't make sense, does it? No, it doesn't. And they can put him in places where he, you know, he says he wasn't and where he puts himself, it couldn't have been, he couldn't have been there. Exactly. And I, it's I, strange, I just, isn't it? I, I just spoke to someone as well off the record. Um, you, sorry, you imagine if you could get him in a court of law? Yeah, yeah. But you can't. <laughs> I, I, I just spoke to someone who wants to remain off the record just a couple of days ago, and this person said that um, all the records of Prince Andrew's movements that show where he was have been destroyed. Oh, well, no. But there are, <laughs> but there are oh, some... What a um, surprise. There are some alarm system records that could be looked into. And the other thing this person said is, that the cops that are in charge of protecting him and destroying all this evidence, they're all in the Freemasons. So if you're a Royal Protection cop who's in the Freemasons, your pay and your everything is like tens of thousands more than just a normal. Right. So that, that, that's how all this has gone yeah. astray, the evidence yeah. against him. Because no, so there's records, isn't there, everywhere they go? Yeah. So, but the police have to be seen to be doing something. But if you know the law that the royal family in this country can't be prosecuted, now you start to think, well, what are they doing? They're doing nothing. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing, doing nothing. But that, does that law then prohibit him from being prosecuted in a foreign jurisdiction? No, if he gets taken out of this country, he's going in. But he's just going to sit in that mansion. He ain't going nowhere. <laughs> he ain't going to go nowhere. He's going to have servants. He's going to have a loving life. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So that's the last questions then. Is there anything you would like to say in conclusion to the people watching this? Yeah, I would like to thank uh, all your subscribers. Uh, this is my last podcast. I'm not doing any more. Ever? Ever. On all channels? No, I'm, I'm going to do my own, but it's for the charity. And what are you doing on your channel? So I'm on Product of a Postcode TV. Uh, it's called Out of the Darkness Into the Light. So I, I've done this in the last lockdown on uh, Zoom chats, and I was interviewing people that i come across in my life. You know. And but not all like villains and and you know things like that. It's just normal life. One of the people that I I interviewed was she used to go round her aunt's house, Auntie Vi's house, and uh, she she used to go round there get uh, clothes, you know, get dinner and clothes. And Auntie Vi was really nice to her. And uh, she went on to be a, a top undercover policeman in this country. And she didn't know Auntie Vi was the crazed mum when she was a kid. Wow. Yeah. Because her dad used to work for the craze. Wow. Yeah, so she didn't know. So I interviewed her, but I had to black her face out. Yeah. And that was really interesting. So I've done it. And so now I want to do it on the YouTube, the charity's YouTube platform to, you know, out the darkness into the light. How have you gained the skills to do? How have I gained the skills to do what I've done? Do you know what I mean? So, you know, you've gone on and you're from tragedy, from whatever, you know, you've come out of the darkness and you turned your life around. So let's talk about that. So me coming on this has now made people talk about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm watching people that would not normally talk about things like that. They're starting to do it now. Brilliant. So I'm done with this. This was brilliant. I've done a couple of others. But I must say, Sean, I've enjoyed yours the most. Do you know what I mean? You do get underneath me and, you know, and, and make me say things that, you really, sometimes I shouldn't say, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, so it's been great. And, you know, just keep doing what you're doing because, you know, you're giving people in insights into, you know, so many different things, so many different things. I mean, you've, you've given me a platform to come on here and to make people understand their dysfunctional upbringing. And it's amazing. So, you know, people sharing their life story in a positive way can do so much good because some people don't like reading books. Some people don't want to go to the doctor and, and tell the doctor this, that, and the other. There's ways of helping yourself. There's self-help things you can do. This is a great tool. It's brilliant. So I want to give people more. You know what I mean? And you will get bits of Gary thrown in as well. <laughs> yeah, along the way. So, yeah, it would be good. It would be good. So please check out Gary's channel, Product of a Postcode. The link is going to be in the description box below the video, as are the links to all of other 
Gary's work, including, you know, the uh, London giving and all of the brilliant charity work that's going on down there as well. Real work, not government bullshit contracts where nothing ever gets done and all the money ends up going in the pockets of these. Yeah. I call them charities <sighs> mortgage providers because they provide all their workers with a good mortgage <laughs> and they pay their work, they pay their rent for them. But what one thing I'd like to ask you about the you know you running the marathon? Would you keep a blog uh, so that we can post it to see how well you're doing? Uh, over the next few months you mean like just document what i'm doing actually running yeah running in preparation yeah, in preparation for the that'll the force marathon. me to do it then won't it if yeah it's, if it's documented yeah so I can't you, hide and, that. I can't. yeah you can put it on <laughs> can't your, be lazy then yeah, you can put it on your platform <laughs> yeah but it might inspire people to then go out and take something up you're gonna run behind me james and... <laughs> yeah yeah it might in, it might inspire someone to to get up you know during lockdown well, i'm gonna go and do it if sean that can do it i'll do it yeah, we'll we'll come up with some kind of little trailer or something. Yeah, for this. Yeah, 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 and yeah. you know it might inspire people. Okay. So if you just keep a little blog, we'll give you a just giving page, yeah. and people can donate to it. Okay, and you know, and together we can make change. Just pray my knees don't blow out. Yeah, <laughs> together we can make change. No, honestly, I admire you for taking up this challenge. Oh, I like a challenge. Yeah, yeah, you've got one. Thank you. Crash. How's your father? <laughs> so if you have enjoyed this video, if. <laughs> please let us know in the comments what you thought of it uh like i said all the links are down there our links are down there as well all of our socials playlists and donation links huge thank you to all the new subscribers been coming in fast subscription logo is in the bottom corner of the screen and huge thank you for all of your guest suggestions and everything else you really are steering this channel like I said, in the last week, we've had Chris Hansen on, a serial killer. It's just absolutely expanding in all kinds of eclectic directions. But as Gary pointed out, the importance of this is to shine this light on what's happening to the most disadvantaged people in society and what we can do about it. And I had, I've had this epiphany now um, after speaking to various people that we need to actually get some people on who are presently homeless in the thick of addiction issues and just hear their life stories to understand yeah. how they got there because I think that is going to be a whole new dimension because a lot of what, what we've been talking about is historical. So that's something I'm going to be looking into Brilliant. In, the, in the coming weeks. And thanks, Joe and James, as well, for coming in and, and filming this today. Brilliant. All right, man, give us a hug. Nice one. Yeah, yeah, cheers. Nice one. Thank cheers, you very much. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers. Appreciate it.